This year, in 11 countries at over 900 program sites, more than 171,000 children are sitting down to a hot meal. For many, it's their only meal of the day. How did these children end up sitting at this table? Who reached out in kindness across the world and told these children they are worth the investment? The answer is simple. The answer is you. By giving one day's wage, you're helping Convoy of Hope fight global hunger. It's a crisis in which 22,000 children a day die due to hunger and poverty-related causes. The task is daunting, but the solution couldn't be more clear. By giving to one day to feed the world, your day's wage is multiplied by Convoy's partners, providing even more life-saving food, clean water, education, and supplies to those in need. For children like Mahar, Stephen, and Manas, your gift means they don't go to bed hungry. They have energy to focus at school, and the door is open to the message of Jesus' love. The power of every meal breaks the cycle of poverty and hopelessness. And in its place, there are brighter futures and a tangible expression of the love of Jesus. For more than 20 years, you've given through Convoy of Hope and the results speak for themselves. More than 85 million people have felt your kindness. It's been packed into boxes and loaded onto trucks, boats, and airplanes. It's been sorted, cooked, and hand-delivered by more than 600,000 volunteers. And finally, it's been delivered to the table, a table where a child sits with an empty stomach, but not for long. Your one day transforms their every day. Good morning. Hey, it's great that you're here today because this is our annual one day to feed the world um, offering that we received. And Heath um, spoke at the first service. I got, I got to tell you, this boy can preach. And so you're in for a treat. Some of you may not know this because you haven't been coming to Canyon View uh, long enough that we have actually been a partner with a, an organization called Convoy of Hope for the past 12 years. In that partnership, we're able to pay in advance to pay forward being able to go into third world countries and even into our own country and bring relief, to bring aid, to bring education, to teach farmers how to farm and become way more uh, productive. And we're able to curb the effects of poverty and the ravages of natural disasters together with Convoy of Hope. And here's the deal, through the local church. And that's what I love, that the love of Christ is shared over and over and over with every meal that's shared with everybody, everybody that has been touched. Because I believe this is God's heart. It's what he's called us to. And I want to read from Isaiah 58. This is where the Lord says, is not this the fast that I choose? To lose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. I just see a connection over and over where God calls us to minister to the poor, and when we do that, God ministers to us. And so I'm going to invite Heath Adamson to come up, and he is on staff with Convoy of Hope. He'll share with you more of what he does. And uh, I've really enjoyed hanging out with Heath, and you will be really blessed by what he's going to share. So let's pray for Heath. Lord, we thank you for our brother Heath. We thank you for the position you've given him at Convoy of Hope to expand your kingdom globally through the compassion that is brought forth through this amazing organization. 
Lord, I pray that you anoint Heath with the ability to communicate clearly, effectively, and powerfully to us. And Lord, may you change our lives today. Thank you for the words you're going to share with us through Heath. And we pray your blessing and your favor upon him. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Everybody, welcome Heath Adamson. Well, good morning. Um, probably the most important thing you need to know about me is I'm still thankful for mercy and grace. How many of you know mercy is when God does not give us what we deserve? And grace is when God gives us what we do not deserve. And I'm thankful. I met Jesus when I was 17. I'm the first uh, Christ follower in my ancestry. I come from a lifestyle steeped in witchcraft, the occult, and other things. And so I'm thankful. So I feel like I met Jesus for the first time uh, just this morning. So I don't deserve to be here, and I mean that. So I'm thankful to the Lord for mercy and grace. Been married to my wife, Allie, for 22 years almost. I met her in eighth grade. She was instrumental uh, to me coming to faith in Christ. One day she was walking down the hallway of our junior high school, and the Lord just whispered subtly to her heart, pray for him. I have a call on his life. Um, and deep down inside, somehow she knew she was going to marry me one day. So after I met Jesus, um, and just God radically transformed me, I was delivered from a lot of demonic things and healed in my body and forgiven, which is the greatest miracle, forgiven. And uh, the very next day, I received a letter in the mail from that girl who at that time was a junior in high school. Uh, five pages, handwritten. How many of you remember the day when people actually used to write stuff on paper, right? And so she answered all the questions I used to ask her about God in middle school. And um, after I married her, I found her prayer journals. And like a good husband, I snooped. I wanted to know what she was praying about. And so 2.53 a.m., upper right-hand corner, God, I pray, reveal yourself to Heath. I pray that Heath will know you. So I'm the product of the prayers of a young girl and her mom who dared to believe the Holy Spirit when he whispered. And so, so I've been married to Allie, and we have two daughters. Dallin is 17, Leighton is 19. I live in a home with girly girls. So I've got cooking utensils that are pink and covered in flowers. And so, guys, I'm sorry. I don't know what it's like to kill a deer. I don't know who won the Super Bowl last year. I can tell you what was on Hallmark last night, though. Okay. So, so that is my world, and I love every bit of it. So it's fantastic. So God, God wired me to be a daddy to two girls, that's for sure. Um, I want to just I want to give honor to someone who's in the room, Sandy Daniels. She's our partner relations director for the entire state of Colorado. I'm looking for Sandy. Sandy, I'm going to embarrass you if you don't mind. If you would please stand, Sandy, where are you? There she is. Please welcome Sandy for me. Thank you, Sandy. <clears throat> Sandy is a key. Uh, leader at Convoy of Hope. She, uh, she serves and she sacrifices and she invested time away from home to be here with us today. If you have any questions about Convoy, if God is putting it on your heart and maybe ways you can continue to partner, whether you're from the corporate sector or whatever it may be, Sandy is your go-to person. So she'll linger around after service for just a few minutes. So Sandy, thanks for being here. Just to honor you. Thank you for your investment. And I want to thank this church for for years. You have been one of the more generous partners of Convoy of Hope from the United States. So thank you once again. One day to feed the world is not a new idea. I know that. I'm standing in a place where you already understand how dear those who are stuck in the cycle of poverty are to, to the heart of the master. And you have helped us feed hundreds of thousands of kids. And I mean that, hundreds of thousands of kids. Not only that, you have helped us share and demonstrate the gospel to each one of those kids. So it's an honor to be with you. And thank you for releasing your pastor, Pastor Kirk. He's obviously a member of our board, um, which is a very strategic role. Convoy of Hope is not led by one person. We take fiduciary responsibility important. We understand the importance of stewardship and integrity, and the board of directors plays a significant role in that. Uh, Pastor Kirk is one of our board members, so thank you for releasing him so that he can share his leadership gift, not just with the body of Christ here in Grand Junction and all around the world, but with the body of Christ through Convoy of Hope, so I appreciate that. 
Um, really quick, the book that was mentioned, Grace in the Valley, this is the most recent book I've written. I invested three years and studied Psalm 23, arguably one of the more recognizable portions of Scripture uh, anywhere in the world. And um, I devoted three years in 2017. I saw the Lord perform a miracle. I watched God heal a girl who was born deaf. And the very next week, my wife, the love of my life, my favorite person in the world, became very sick, and we had a 48-hour window where she was going to live or die. And I remember I was in the hospital room in the wee hours of a morning, just Allie and I. She was obviously out, hooked up to a lot of tubes and machines. I had my Bible open to Psalm 23, and um, how many of you know, even when you memorize it, sometimes it's important just to read it again. I'm reading Psalm 23, and I once again reflected on the fact that the Lord prepares His table for us in the presence of our enemies. He does not prepare the table in the green pasture. He prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies. And sometimes what we think is a spiritual attack is actually an invitation from God to feast. And so in my research, I realized that green pasture and the valley of the shadow of death are actually the same place. And if we will turn our back on the enemy, who is always invited to the feast the sovereign one throws, if we will turn our back on the enemy and dare to sit down at the table and gaze into the eyes of our king, where if we look long enough, we will catch a pure reflection of who we really are in the eyes of the Lord, there's a realm of intimacy that exists with God that is not found in the green pasture. It's found in the valley, the valley of the shadow of death, but it's only a shadow. So it's available everywhere books are sold. Does anybody happen to have a birthday today or uh, anybody have a birthday this week? I'll give you a copy. Anybody? Okay, the first one, if you come get it, I'll give it to you. Here you go. It's your birthday, sweetie. There you go. I made a little note to you. I prayed and asked God to put something on my heart, so there's a note in there for you. I hope you enjoy that. In a moment, we will be in Acts chapter 3. If you've got a Bible, iPhone, iPad, Droid, Galaxy, whatever, we will be in Acts chapter 3. And today what I want to talk to you about is making sure no one switches your lid. So as a kid, I had a fairly unique childhood. I won't get into it today. We don't have time. But it was fairly dysfunctional, fairly toxic. So my favorite thing to do was to go to my grandma's house. I called her Ma. I found out as a teenager she had a real name. It's called Sylvia. But I called her Ma, and I loved going to Ma's house on Saturday mornings because it was predictable, and like clockwork, I knew what to expect. So we always showed up at Ma's house at 8 o'clock on Saturday morning, and the first thing we did is we had breakfast. And Ma came out of the kitchen with her cute little cotton flowered apron, and she served us the same thing for breakfast every single time. First thing she had in her hands was an ice-cold two-liter of Coca-Cola Classic. She had a fresh pot of black coffee, and then a paper plate filled with oatmeal cookies. Now, they were not homemade oatmeal cookies, and they were not cookies, nor was there any oatmeal in them. These are the things that I'm convinced somebody went to the lumber yard, swept up all the dust off the floor, pressed it into a uh, communion wafer, and took Elmer's glue and powdered sugar, mixed some icing, stuck it on top, and they sell a 1,000 of these suckers for 99 cents to crazy grannies. That's what we had. And so as a preschooler, I love going to Ma's for breakfast because everything tastes good when you dip it in Coca-Cola and coffee, right? So at about 8.30, after breakfast was over, we went out into the yard, and we always, you know, participated in some projects. So sometimes we mowed our lawn, we pulled weeds, we cut down, you know, we trimmed the trees. Sometimes we scraped our wood siding and put a fresh coat of white latex paint on there. We washed our windows, hosed off the screens, cleaned out the gutters, picked up the dead snakes, you catch the drift. And once a month, we took Ma to the grocery store, Dolls Foods, on Euclid Avenue in Des Moines, Iowa, to be exact. And we took her to the grocery store once a month where she picked up her supplies, not just for breakfast, but her supplies for the lunch that she always fed us on Saturdays after we were done with yard work. And as always, it was predictable. She went down aisle one, picked up a loaf of white Wonder Bread, took a left, went down aisle three. That's where she picked up her cans of deviled ham. Now, so for those of you who have no idea what deviled ham is, it's the stuff that won't make it into the can of spam, okay? So you open up a can of deviled ham, and it's half minced meat, half lard, and you mix it all together, you put it on white Wonder Bread, and you need a boatload of Fleischmann's mustard just to get it down. So aisle four is where she picked up her Fleischmann's mustard. 
From time to time, she grabbed a few bags of chips, one of my favorites, plain Lay's thin potato chips. And in the summer months, she always picked out a melon. Now, Ma had a peculiar way of picking out melons. As a child, Ma grew up in extreme poverty. She went to school through the eighth grade, and um, she never had a home. She lived in her tent with her family her entire life until after she married and her husband died at the invasion of Normandy. Thank God for the men and women who serve our country in our military and armed services. But after, yeah. So after her husband passed away, the government gave her a check for a few thousand dollars, and with that money, she purchased her first home. So, but Ma grew up, they were migrant farmers, so she detasseled corn, she walked beans, she picked cotton. So in the grocery store, when it was time to pick out melons, Ma had a unique way. Ma always walked up to the wooden square where they had the watermelons, and she walked up and she began to spank the melons. Now listen, when you're a teenage boy and Granny's spanking melons in the grocery store, it's a bit awkward. And then Ma, after she spanked the melon, she picked up a melon, shook it, and held it up to her ear. And only God and the angels know what Ma heard. But when she heard the right thing come from the right melon, she stuck it in the cart, and we always went to the cash register. And that's where, once a month, Ma picked out her brand new jigsaw puzzle. Now, I personally like puzzles. And Ma, once again, had a peculiar way of putting together her puzzles. Maybe you can relate. She took the plastic off of the box took the lid off of the box, flipped the box upside down, right side up to all of the pieces, and initially looked for the four corners. You always have a freebie, copyright, Milton Bradley, bottom right-hand corner. And then she began to build the outside of the frame of the puzzle based on the picture that was on the lid that she propped up against the wall. You guys know what I'm talking about? And as a kid, I remember thinking, what would happen if I switched Ma's lid? And I'm telling you, that's the first time I ever heard Ma cuss. And it's also the first time, and yes, there was more than once, the first time she spanked me. And a woman who spanks melons can whip a little boy's honey pretty good, trust me. You know, it was interesting to watch Ma because she had all of the right pieces, and she was trying to put together and assemble something that the creator of the puzzle never intended her to put together. And I would suggest to you, it is possible to have all of the right pieces, but you become disillusioned and frustrated when you try to build something the designer never intended you to build. And I believe we have all of the right pieces in the church of Jesus Christ. The right pieces, things like the Word of God. Thank God for the Bible. We have the right pieces like prayer and fasting and community and church. Thank God for the church. The church is the only organization God promised to build. The most important organization in the world is not the UN, it's not an NGO, it's not a Fortune 500 company, it's not anything, it's not a professional sports team, not even the Denver Broncos, believe it or not. The most important organization in the world is the Church of Jesus Christ, and God is the architect, and it's His, therefore everything we do and touch is a stewardship. But we can have all of the right pieces, and if we don't have a piece that says, remember the poor... We're building something off of the wrong lid. And when I look at Jesus, I see that Jesus, the life and message of the one who gave it all for the sins of the world, that Jesus demonstrated that God has a heart for those who are stuck in the cycle of physical and spiritual poverty. So who is Jesus? I don't want to assume that we all know. Well, we know that Jesus was a historical figure, a Hebrew male, who spoke Aramaic, and yet his teachings are recorded in Greek. Some scholars tell us he communicated on a third grade level. Others tell us a sixth grade level. Which is it? I frankly don't have a clue. It depends on what book you read. What I do know is that Jesus communicated in a language even children could understand. How do we know that? It was the little boy who brought five loaves of bread and two small fish to the sovereign one. He gave thanks, and then the multitude was fed. Don't you love that about Jesus? Jesus was so full of the kingdom of God. He came in contact with dead people, and they were resurrected. You remember the story when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead? He walks up to the tomb. What does he say? It's recorded in the text. He says, Lazarus, come forth. I would submit to you that Jesus, 
Yeshua HaMashiach, the anointed one, so full of the kingdom of God that the reason why he summoned Lazarus by name is had he stood outside the tomb and said, come forth, everybody who had ever died would have been resurrected. You know, we serve a God who speaks and galaxies form, but when God created humanity, God did not speak. God scooped up a mound of dirt and he breathed. God saved his very breath for us. We were formed and fashioned for the breath of God, the Ruach of God, the Holy Spirit of God to come and live inside. That's who Jesus is. He was so full of the kingdom of God that dead people were resurrected and yet so approachable, so gentle, so simple that children felt safe around him. You know, how many of you know sometimes people use their spirituality as an excuse to be a little weird and creepy? I love that God is simple. Simplicity enables excellence. You know, in our modern culture, people are not offended because God is so deep. Perhaps it's because Jesus, the message of Jesus is so simple. What Jesus communicated in a language children could understand. You know that Jesus didn't come to convert people to Christianity. Jesus did not come to create Christianity. Jesus did not come because he is the preferred way. He is not the most relevant way. He is not the popular way. He is not the cool way. He is not the American way. He is not the vineyard way. He is not the Republican way or the Democratic way. He is not the Libertarian way or the Green Party way. He is the only way. And Jesus didn't just come to teach people what to believe. I suggest he also came to teach people how to believe. He didn't come to make converts. He came so that we can make disciples. And a disciple of Jesus does not memorize God. We become like God. And when we become like God, we cannot help but think and feel the way God does. And you will never find anybody on the earth who is stuck in the cycle of physical and spiritual poverty that God is not madly in love with. If we have all of the right pieces, but yet we neglect to love and care for the poor, we are building something that the creator of the lid never intended us to build. So for just a few minutes, I want to make sure that nobody ever switches our lid. For this great church, this is not a new truth. I just want to remind you of something that's been there all along. So in Acts chapter 3, we come to a story. It's a true story. It really happened. It says, Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. The ninth hour is three in the afternoon. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, they asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. And so he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. And then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand. He lifted him up. And immediately, everybody say immediately. Immediately, his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, praising God. I love this story. You know, when you look at Jesus, Jesus cared about people who were marginalized. You remember when Jesus healed the leper? I think it's Matthew 8. I don't know if you've ever come in contact with someone who has leprosy. I have. It's one of the most devastating things because lepers are people just like us who come from families. Some of them are married. Some of them have kids. Some of them went to vocational school or college, but because they came down with this horrific disease, they are quarantined and become recluse in society. Lepers are usually missing body parts. Sometimes their ears are gone or the front half of their nose is gone and their bodies emanate an odor from decaying, decrepit flesh. And Jesus, when he heals the leper, it's recorded in the text, he doesn't just say, be healed and keep going. Jesus slows down long enough to notice and Jesus touches the leper. I love that. I love that Jesus touched the untouchable. I love that God cares enough about the marginalized. He slows down long enough to notice, and he touches them. You remember the story when the woman is caught in adultery? It's one of the more scandalous stories in the gospel. A woman is caught in the act of adultery, 
But rather than dragging the man and the woman, they only drag the woman. That tells me that this story is not just one of somebody committing sin, like adultery, and it's not a weakness, by the way. It's not a mistake. It's a sin. Jesus didn't die for our mistakes. How many of you know it's not a weakness? It's a sin. And the wages of sin is death. Are you with me? You guys believe in sin, don't you? You guys believe in grace too, though, don't you? A woman is caught in sin, and they don't drag the man. They only drag the woman at a time when a woman was not allowed to go to synagogue, at a time when a woman could not receive an education. Why didn't they drag the man? I would suggest it's an issue of gender inequality. They caught the woman in the act of adultery, and rather than bringing the man, they let the man go, and they dragged the woman. A woman who is being discriminated against, did she sin? Yes. Does she need the grace of God? Yes. But the story in the gospel is so much more than that. Jesus is um, enraged at the injustice over gender inequality. Jesus, such a revolutionary, that he invited women into the story that is being written by the same divine hand that is writing ours. At a time when women could not go to synagogue, Jesus invited women to establish and build the kingdom of God on the earth. When you look at gender inequality in the earth today, God is not okay with it. And thank God for people like you who partner with us so that we can help people understand that it is not just those who are male who are created in the image of God, it is also those who are female. Amen. Jesus inserts himself into a moment of injustice, and he doesn't just say, oh, that's too bad. He inserts himself. I love that about God. I love that when Jesus is standing on the side of a hill and there are thousands of people who are literally without food. He addresses the issue of food insecurity. And the little boy who I mentioned previously, he brings five loaves of barley bread, barley, the bread of the poor. Five loaves of barley bread and two small fish. He gives thanks and the multitude is fed. And in that story, we do not see that Jesus gives an altar call. It tells me sometimes it is profoundly spiritual to just love somebody and not try to convert them. It is profoundly spiritual to feed kids who wake up in the morning and have no idea what they're going to eat. Now, I want to be clear. If we preach a gospel apart from justice and compassion, we preach a gospel Jesus never preached. He touched the leper. He inserted himself in the woman who was caught in adultery. He fed the multitude. If we preach a gospel apart from justice and compassion, our lid has been switched. But if all we do is focus on justice and compassion... Apart from the gospel, we give people a better brand of eternal misery. It is not either or, it is both and. And that's what we see in the life and message of Jesus. And that's what we see in Acts chapter 3. So in order to understand what the Bible means, we have to understand what it meant. So let's go back a chapter. The book of Acts was written by Luke, a Gentile physician, actually. And he records the historical narrative after the resurrection of Jesus in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, one of the coolest church services that's ever happened takes place. Maybe you've read about it before. Um, It's during the Feast of Pentecost. Our English Bible describes it as the Day of Pentecost. And there's this small group of people. They're in a time of prayer. And all of a sudden, something unique happens. The Bible says that the little room they're in is filled with something that sounds like a violent wind. The uh, The ground underneath their feet is literally shaken. Balls of fire come down and sit on top of their head. It's a story for a believing believer. It really happened. And they speak in a spiritual language, a language they had not previously learned. God is the one who is responsible for this entire um, experience. After this happens, they're accused of being drunk on new wine, which is hilarious because the grape harvest won't occur for another month. They couldn't be drunk on new wine. There was no new wine. And a group of people are severely misunderstood and criticized for something that God is responsible for. I would suggest to you one of the primary evidences that we are full of the Spirit of God is we are willing to courageously stand and be misunderstood for something God is doing in our generation. We are born with the need to have approval from those who disapprove of us. And God is looking for people who have the courage to stand and the humility to bow and partner with Jesus to establish the kingdom of God in our day. Are you with me? And after this happens, Peter stands up. He communicates the simple gospel 
of Jesus. And by the time you come to the end of Acts chapter 2, about five years have taken place. From Acts chapter 2, verse 1, to the end of chapter, about five years. And so we see this group of a few thousand people who have folded into the fabric of their life a spiritual rhythm. They're, they're disciples. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47, what it looks like they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. That means that they understood the value of the Word of God as they had it at that time. They were people of prayer. They were people that could be accused of being generous, so much so that the Bible tells us nobody among them even had a need. I love that. They took care of one another. It's one of the beautiful things about the church. We take care of one another. And this group of people who were there in the upper room, in Acts chapter 2, they felt the wind, they felt the shaking, they had a ball of fire on their head, they spoke in a spiritual language. Every single day at 3 in the afternoon, they go to the temple to pray. Now, I don't know about you, but going to a prayer meeting every single day is pretty cool. I appreciate their devotion. But every single day, they go to the temple at the hour of prayer, and the Bible tells us that laid at the beautiful gate is a beggar, who according to Acts chapter 4, verse 22, had been laid there for over 40 years. I don't know about you, but I wonder, how is it that somebody who can be in the upper room, God lights their head on fire, the wind of heaven blows across their face, they speak in a spiritual language, and yet on their way to prayer, they walk past the beggar. You know, our encounters in the presence of God come with a risk. They can result in deeper times with the Holy Spirit, but if we overlook those that God lays in our path, we become more shallow as a church. Our Pentecostal experience means nothing if we overlook the beggar on the way to prayer. Are you with me? And so I love that Peter and John teach us how profound it is to simply slow down long enough to notice. And so that takes us to Acts chapter 3. The Bible tells us that at 3 in the afternoon, they're going to the temple to pray. And here's this person who was lame from birth. You know, at this time, the custom was if someone in your family was lame, you did not lay them at a gate. You took them into your home, and you took care of them. They obviously didn't have nursing homes back then. They didn't have hospice. They didn't even have hospitals. What they had was family. So when a family member has physical challenges, you didn't rely on anybody because there was nobody to rely on. You took them into your home, and the family took care of one another. The fact that this man is laid daily for over 40 years at the gate to beg tells me he either sat in quiet desperation, he had no family, or his family cared enough to lay him at the gate but didn't care enough to take him into their home. It's easy to infer from the text, based on what I just said, that this man is lonely. This man does not have a significant support system. This man wakes up and he does not know how he's going to go to the public space so that he can ask for alms. Now, in Scripture, there are three levels of giving. There's the tithe, the offering, and alms. For those of you that may not be familiar, the tithe, tithe means tenth or 10%. The tithe is when we give 10% of our income to the local church. I tithe. I'm assuming everybody here does. Tithing is not a suggestion. Tithing is a commandment. And it's not that God wants 10%. God wants it all. And 10% is just a good reminder that it all belongs to him to begin with. If God didn't provide oxygen to breathe, we wouldn't have woke up today. Are you with me? So God is our great provider. So our tithe does not go to one day to feed the world. Our tithe does not go to Convoy of Hope. The tithe goes to the church. Well, the second level of give, giving, if you will, that's found in the Word of God is an offering. That's what we're going to do at the end of today's church service. Some people today can give $10,000 in the offering. Some people today can give $25. There may be some single moms here who can't give $10,000. There may be some single moms here who can. It's not necessarily equal giving. Excellence is not being the best. Excellence is doing your best with what's in your hand. It is a stewardship. And an offering is when we give above and beyond our tithe. We're going to do that today, and you're going to help us continue to feed a lot of kids. But Scripture also talks about something called the alm. And the alm is different than the tithe, and it's different than the offering. The alm is when you walk into the gas station, because if you're like me, you like 99-cent all-beef hot dogs. 
and you walk into the gas station, that sucker's 99 cents. You give them a dollar, they give you a penny. How many of you know, what do you do with the penny? Listen, I'll save nickels and dimes and quarters, but pennies, I typically take the penny and I put it in that little plastic thing that's right there by the cash register. Maybe you do the same. I'm thinking, it's just a penny. I can't even buy a Tootsie Roll anymore for a penny. Remember the days when Tootsie Rolls were three cents? Tootsie Rolls are like a quarter now. It's highway robbery. Back in the day, you could get a Tootsie for a penny. I'll drop the penny in the little plastic thing because you can't do much with it. This beggar is asking for alms. It would be like begging for the penny. It would be like you walking into the gas station and the penny falls out of your pocket. I always stop and pick up the penny when I drop it. Some of you may not. Some of you look at it on the ground and you think, ah, it's not even worth the effort to bend over. May not get back up. So you just leave the penny because after all, it's just a penny. The beggar is laying at the beautiful gate begging, can I just have the penny? Please. He's not asking for much. He doesn't want to get rich. He's just asking for an alm. And every single day, people who had their heads lit on fire, who spoke in tongues, are walking past the beggar. I'm not casting aspersions. They're not bad people. We've all made the same mistake. Sometimes it's important to remember we slow down long enough to notice that there's an impoverished generation that's been laid in our path. And we can not only make a difference, we can make the difference. The Bible tells us he's begging, and he's laid at the beautiful gate. What is the beautiful gate? Well, I did some research. Here's what I found out. The beautiful gate sat on top of what is called the Temple Mount. If you've ever been to Jerusalem, you can, you can find some evidence of what used to be the Temple Mount. But the Temple Mount back then, some scholars tell us it was the size of 15 football fields. A few other references say it was the size of 35 football fields. I frankly don't care how big it was. All I know is it was big. So you've got what's called the Temple Mount, and there used to be this massive structure called Herod's Temple. It was made out of marble. Well, there were different courtyards around Herod's Temple when it existed. It was destroyed around AD 70 by the Romans. But there was this place called the Courtyard of the Gentiles. It would be like this, where anybody could come in. You could have a, maybe your family, you're walking under the beautiful sun, you're hanging out. It didn't matter what your religious background was. You could walk into the courtyard of the Gentiles. And adjacent to it was this gate called the Beautiful Gate. It was 50 feet high. To put that in perspective, it would be like standing on the ground, going to the ceiling, and maybe multiplying that times two. So it was 50 feet high. It was 40 feet wide. It was made out of brass, and it was covered in Corinthian gold. They called it the Beautiful Gate primarily because sunlight hit the gold and it was beautiful. Yes, pun intended. And here's this beggar who's laid at the beautiful gate. The fact that the beggar was not seen is almost impossible because everybody would have noticed the beautiful gate. But somehow their lid got switched, and every single day as they're serving God, as they're devoted to Scripture, they're going to the temple at the hour of prayer, and Peter and John do something a bit unique. They slow down, and they notice the beggar, and the beggar is asking for alms. And Peter's response, I just read it to you, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. You can infer from the text that if he had silver and gold, he would have given it. You know, sometimes we're afraid to create dependency when we serve the poor. And I understand that. That's, very, that's a very real tension. A Convoy of Hope, we're very intentional to make sure we do not create dependency. We want lives to be transformed. But sometimes we're so concerned about creating dependency with the poor that we make an even greater mistake, and that's we neglect the poor. When Peter says, silver and gold I do not have, you can infer that he's saying, if I had it, I would give it to you. But then he says, what I do have, I give you. And here we see it's the two-sided coin. One, it's okay to help people in need. But secondly, they need something more than just a hand up. They need the love and the transformative effect of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Peter says, silver and gold I do not have. What I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Peter is not afraid to be politically incorrect. 
He's not afraid to be accused of anything other than, you know what? I know somebody who can transform your life, and I'm not shy, and I'm not embarrassed about it. His name is Jesus of Nazareth. Here, give me your hand. And he reaches out, and the Bible says immediately he is strengthened, and he jumps up, and he is healed. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen anyone who is supernaturally healed who couldn't walk. I have. I've seen it quite a few times, actually. And there has never been one occasion when somebody can't walk, and all of a sudden they're healed, and they look at you and they ask, what should I do next? Whenever someone's healed, they don't have to ask, do you think it's a good idea for me to get up? Every single time I've ever seen God supernaturally heal somebody, they get up and immediately they start dancing, shouting, walking, doing whatever it takes. Why in the world did Peter grab him by the hand? It's an anomaly to me. The guy's healed. He's over 40 years of age. I'm 42 to put it in perspective. He's healed, but Peter still grabs him by the hand. I think it's a great example of what the gospel really looks like. That sometimes God inserts his sovereign hand into the earth, and he does things like healing people. We know that Peter didn't heal the guy. John didn't heal the guy. It's Jesus. Jesus is the hero of the story. But not only did Jesus do something miraculous, Peter did something as miraculous. Peter reaches out and touches somebody who had been overlooked and forgotten simply because he was stuck in poverty. That's what one day to feed the world is all about. We recognize that, God, you are doing something all throughout the earth. You are transforming lives physically. You are, tra you are transforming lives emotionally and spiritually. And, God, I want to be a part of it. I want to partner with you. That's what happened in Acts 3. The guy goes walking, leaping, praising God. He goes walking. He is transformed physically. He goes leaping. He is transformed emotionally. He goes, praising God, he is transformed spiritually. This is the gospel, spirit, soul, and body, transformed and completely renewed. But Peter had a role to play. I would suggest that this man would have died there begging had Peter not slowed down long enough to notice. And that's why in great churches like this, I know you love God, and I know year after year you have been so generous. You have given sacrificially, and I want to thank you. But days like this are strategic because our lives, candidly, can be busy. We've got school. We've got kids. We've got foster kids. We're volunteering. We're serving. We've got bills to pay. We've got football games to watch. It's all great stuff. But sometimes every now and then, we just need a friendly reminder that there's a generation of people who have been laid in our path. And on our way to prayer, let's just slow down long enough and notice. Let's notice the poor. I want to show you something that happened 13 days ago because of your generosity. 13 days ago in Burkina Faso, we opened up our first feeding program. 13 days ago on October 1st, it was their first day of school. And 600 kids came to school for the first time, and guess what they experienced? They experienced a fresh, nutritious, hot meal for the first time in their lives at school. Can I tell you what happened? These kids ate first thing in the morning. They sat down. They were attentive. They listened. We only feed kids at schools. Why? Because we want to end the cycle of poverty. And there's a direct cor cor corollary relationship between feeding kids at school and their ability to see their level of education improved. We only feed kids at school, and we only feed kids in partnership with the local church. The local church is our exit strategy. We don't open up the back of a pickup truck and feed kids and keep driving. We feed kids at schools with the church because the church is the only organization God promised to build. 600 kids ate that morning. 600 kids were able to take containers of food back home. And what happened in Burkina is the same thing, same thing that happens in places like Sri Lanka, India, the Philippines, Togo, Tanzania, Ethiopia, Nicaragua, Honduras, and many other places in the world, some places I can't tell you about because technically it's illegal for us to be there, where kids eat a full nutritious meal and then we put it in containers and they take it home. And many of the kids whose parents have no access to food, whose siblings have no access to food, they're able to feed their families as well. Because people like you understand that one day can actually feed the world. I want to show you another picture of the kitchen that we built. We had some volunteers who helped us build a kitchen because it's one thing to feed the kids 
But if you feed the kids and you don't deworm them, what happens is, is you cause their stomachs to explode. One of the biggest mistakes you can do is just feed a kid a lot of micronutrients and high caloric intake without deworming them. It actually kills them. So we deworm kids. We also have a team of scientists to help us understand. We don't just want to feed kids. We want to feed kids nutritious meals. And so in a kitchen like that, we're able to prepare the food and make sure that our micronutrients are included in the food. And it's amazing. And it's because of a sanitary kitchen in the middle of Burkina Faso, in the middle of nowhere, where radical um, religious people are trying to recruit young people and convince them that it's okay to strap explosives to your chest because somehow that will honor a God who's not even real. In the middle of nowhere, we can feed kids, we can transform their lives, we can educate them, all because people like you give money. It's true. One day to feed the world can actually feed the world. So I leave you with this verse, Luke chapter 14, verse 13. Jesus said, hey, when you throw a party, invite the poor. That's what we're doing today. Take one day's wage, let's throw a party. Let's throw a party in Burkina. Let's throw a party in Togo. Let's throw a party in the eight countries that Pastor Kirk will hear about this fall when he's at the board meeting that we're recommending we open up activity in. Eight new countries, we want to throw a party. And guess who we're inviting? We're not inviting dignitaries. We're not inviting nobility. Not earthly nobility. We're inviting heavenly nobility. Sons and daughters of the king. We're throwing a feast and we're inviting the poor. Why? Because there's no such thing as a junior Holy Spirit. And the key to spiritual awakening all around the world is not just here. It's in kids that have been laid in the path of people like us who are on our way to prayer. God is saying, hey, Slow down for just a long enough. I want you to notice. Amen. I pray, God, that today you will plant a seed in our heart and that we will never allow our lid to get switched. I want to thank you for the right pieces to the puzzle. I thank you for the gift of prayer. I thank you for faith. I thank you for the word of God. I thank you for community in the church. I thank you for healing. I thank you for communion. I thank you for all of the right pieces. But God, we don't want to forget an important piece. The peace to love and serve those who are stuck in the cycle of poverty, the poor and the suffering. We don't want to forget the peace that says, when you throw a feast, therefore it is assumed that we will, when you throw a feast, invite the poor. I pray that our lid will never get switched, not just halfway around the world, but even here in Grand Junction. I want to thank you for the sacrifice and generosity of these great people who year after year understand it is profoundly spiritual to provide food for those who wake up in the morning and have no idea where they're going to get it. I want to thank you, God, that providing a meal in the name of Jesus, we do it unto you. I want to thank you, God, that these kids in Burkina Faso we just saw, these kids are royalty. They're made in your image. And when they go to school tomorrow, they're going to hear about it. I want to thank you for this church, and I pray, God, that you will perform a miracle. I pray, God, for a multiplication effect to be applied to the offering. I pray, God, that you will use the relationship between Convoy and this great church to see hundreds of thousands of kids fed physically and transformed spiritually. Let it be for your name and for your honor. I ask it humbly. But I ask it boldly, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.